Hey, if we've never met before or this is your first time here, my name's Chris. I'm the associate pastor. I am so glad to be here with you guys this morning. Uh, it has been a crazy two weeks in the Hallback House. So uh, last week, we got to go through a hurricane together, which is wonderful. Uh, this week, we moved. Uh, and so it has just been a crazy, crazy time. I am so worn out. But I hope you know that I am I'm still glad to be here and glad to give you what little energy I have left in my body this morning. Well, going through a hurricane last week was the first time since being in Texas that my wife and I have gotten to really experience a hurricane in Texas. We lived here for three years. It's the first time one's come like right over us. And I think at this point, it's really like a rite of passage to be in Texas. Like to be a true Texan, you've got to go through a hurricane at some point. And I'm going to be honest with you guys for a second. It's a ritual I absolutely could have gone without. Uh, we were without power for only three days, but it was still a long three days. But during that time, we survived on PB&Js, leftover barbecue, and a trip to Chili's, which I feel like really is the true Texan way. Uh, and so we made it through perfectly fine. But here's what I have learned about Texas. I went through hurricanes in living in Mississippi growing up. We went through Katrina, and by the time it got to me in Jackson, Katrina was already a Category 5 when it hit, and it still hit as a Category 3 in Mississippi. And it knocked power out for over a week. And so I, I, I have vivid memories of that from my childhood. And yet I will still tell you that a Texas hurricane, even as a Category 1, whole different ballgame. And the reason is it knocks out power. And in Texas, I think the state, like nature takes that as a challenge. And so I think the state itself really like tried to steam us alive in the process of this. And I've also learned that Texas, when there's no power and it, it's messed up all the lights and everything, traffic gets six times worse, which I didn't even think was possible. And I've also learned that people in Texas do not understand four-way stops when the lights go out. They do not get it. Yeah, amen to that, I know. So here's what I'm learning. Texas, especially Houston, cannot function without power. One, I think it throws society into just absolute chaos. But along with that, you also have things like hospitals, right? If hospitals lose power here in Houston, it's a big deal because it can literally lead to people dying. And so this is what makes the jobs of people like electrical linemen so important. Now, Hannah, my wife and I, we have several family members in Georgia who are, have worked or are currently working as electrical linemen for these companies out in Georgia. And if you have anybody in your family or know anybody who does this job, you know it's not only important, it's a dangerous job, right? You're dealing with high voltages, you're dealing with heights, and most often when they're having to go out and do stuff, it's usually because of something like a storm. And so you're navigating down trees and floodwaters and all of these things, and it's a big deal. But the linemen... They know what's at stake, right? They know that the cost is too high to do nothing, that if they don't do their jobs, people could literally lose their life. And so they make the choice to step up and act because they know what will happen if they don't. Now, this morning, we're kicking off a series with you guys called Lessons from Joseph. And Joseph, if you're not familiar, he's a character or, or a person from the Old Testament, and he's got a really interesting story. Joseph experiences some really low points in his life, but also some incredibly high points and everything in between. And what's really neat about the story of Joseph is there's a lot of parallels and lessons that we can draw from to learn about in our lives. And so what we're gonna do is take the next couple of weeks to look at his life and some of the people around him and learn what we can from that. So this morning, we're gonna start with the very beginning of Joseph's story in Genesis 37. And as you start out the story, you're gonna find out that immediately there's drama. We're already at this high stakes point because Joseph, we're gonna find out very quickly, his life is at risk. But what's interesting is that in this moment, Joseph's story doesn't really start with him at the focus. In fact, the beginning of his story is actually really gonna hinge on the actions of two individuals, Jacob, his father, and Reuben, one of his brothers. And what we're gonna see is that the way that they act is important because if they choose to do nothing, Jacob's, or Joseph's future and ultimately his life is at risk. And so the cost is too high for them to do nothing. So let me ask you this morning. Do you understand that the cost is too high to do nothing? And I'm not talking about your power, I'm not talking about Joseph here, but can we recognize and understand that there is an epidemic all around us, that there is a problem in this world for which we know the solution? 
See, here's the deal. We live in a world that's broken, marred, and mangled by sin. And the only answer to the darkness of this world is Jesus. But people can't follow who they don't know. And so our job as Christians, what we have to be willing to do is to step up and share the message and the truth of Jesus with the broken world, that we have to step out of our comfort zones and take the message of the gospel to a broken world because it's the only hope to save it. And so this morning, the focus of our message is the cost is too high to do nothing. So if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, you can open those up to Genesis 37. And we're gonna look at this and I wanna talk about three truths that we can learn from Joseph's story. And we're gonna start by looking at verse two this morning. Verse two says, this is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the son of Bilah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. So we're gonna stop here and I'll give you a little bit of background on the story of Joseph. So Joseph himself, he is one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Now Jacob is the son of Isaac, who was the promised son to Abraham. And the reason that God promised Abraham Isaac is that he made a covenant with Abraham that he would bless him and make him a great nation, which is where that nation of Israel would come from. And so Jacob's sons, all 12 of them are who would eventually become the fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel. But before we have a great nation with 12 tribes, we have 12 brothers and their dad. And we're gonna quickly find out, and anybody here who knows this, a family full of brothers, there's drama. And anybody who has a brother in here who, who's lived with siblings knows exactly what I'm talking about when I say this, that the younger sibling they don't let you get away with anything. We can definitively define the younger sibling as the tattler. (laughs) Growing up, I have a younger brother. And this may not shock you, but my brother and I used to get in fights all the time. Now, he started every single one of them, or at least that's what I used to tell my mother. But inevitably, as the bigger brother, we would get into these fights, I would overpower him and I would win, and he would go run to mom. And of course, as the older brother, I got in trouble because you're not supposed to punch your brother in the face, and I'm aware of that. Now, did him tattling on me keep me from doing it? Absolutely not. Still fought all the time. But what I could count on was I was not gonna get away with it because the tattler, always at the ready. And so in our story this morning, within one verse, we're introduced to a 17-year-old kid named Joseph. And what we learn at the very beginning of Joseph's story is he's run to his dad to tell on his brothers. In walks Joseph the tattler to give a bad report on his brothers. And in our next verses, we're gonna learn a little bit more about why he's telling on his brothers. Look at verses three and four with me. It says, now Israel loved Joseph, Israel is Jacob, more than any of his other sons because he'd been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe for him And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. So there's a good bit to unpack here in these two verses. First, we learn quickly, Joseph is Jacob's favorite. And it's not even like a contest. Like this is not just, ah, he has some of the same hobbies as him and he hangs out with him, he really enjoys it. It straight up says, Jacob loved Joseph more than the other sons. It's got a sting to the brothers, right? But more than that, Jacob actually chooses to honor Joseph in a way that's completely different from the other brothers. Scripture says that he brings him an ornate robe and gives it to him, or as it's sometimes translated, a coat of many colors. Now, parents, let's just stop for a second and talk about Parenting 101. Jacob is like the prime example right here of what not to do with your children. One, don't put tears on your love for your children. Two, maybe don't clothe one of them in Ralph Lauren and Lululemon while the other kids are rocking the Kirkland brand signature line. But you're not really setting yourself or your children up for success in this moment. But this isn't just some fancy robe here. It's not some coat. The Hebrew word used for this coat, this robe, actually refers to a tunic 
that extended to the wrists and all the way to the feet. This is not the robe of a working man. This is the tunic of a man with status. And so what this is, is this is Jacob very dramatically telling the rest of his family, telling his brothers that Joseph is the son who will inherit the birthright. And so up to this point, what happens is that Joseph no longer works in the field with his brothers. He now watches over them because he's a man of status. So put yourself in Joseph's brother's shoes for a second, right? You're older, you were born first, you technically should be superior in every way, right? You earned your place as one of Jacob's sons. What did Joseph do? He was dad's favorite. And so the favoritism of Joseph from Jacob lends to a hatred from his brothers. It doesn't say that he dislikes them. The Hebrew word literally translates to this idea of hating the enemy, that Joseph, he wasn't the brother to dislike, he's the enemy to get rid of. But up to this point, this hatred has manifested itself mainly in being mean. They don't like him, they don't wanna be around him, and the brothers don't wanna be nice to him. But Joseph, like any true teenager, escalates the situation further in our next verses. So look at me what happens in verses five through 11. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. And his brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and he again told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream and this time the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. And when he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you have had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down at the ground before you? So we finally find out why Joseph is tattling on his brothers. Here's what happens. Joseph and his brothers don't get along. Joseph, in his infinite 17-year-old wisdom, knows this and still decides to walk up to his brothers and go, guess what I just found out? God told me I'm gonna rule over y'all. And God told me later I'm gonna rule over y'all and mom and dad. So naturally, not a good reaction from the brothers, right? Scripture says they hate him all the more. And then he goes to his dad and he's like, dad, can you believe what they said? And uh, Jacob rebukes him because he says, you think you're gonna rule over your mother and your father? It's ridiculous. But this reaction from Jacob is not what's really important in the story. It's what's gonna happen in the next verses. So we've set ourselves up for this big crescendo event, right? That everything's building, the tensions are building and a lot's gonna happen in our next verses. Look with me at verses 11 through 18. It starts with his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. So come, I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to them, go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. So he's going to report on them. Then he sent them off from the valley of Hebron. And when Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? He replied, well, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they're grazing their flocks? And he's like, they've moved on from here. The man answered, I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But listen to verse 18. But they saw him in the distance and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. So Joseph's situation is going from intense sibling rivalry to them plotting his death. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what's happening right here. Given the way that they already feel about Joseph, when Joseph finds himself in the middle of some random field and nobody's around to witness anything, kind of a recipe for a death trap in the making. So Joseph, unknowingly, is walking to his death in this moment. And what's sad is Jacob should have known what was happening should have known this was a possibility because Jacob, more than anyone else, knows how cruel brothers can be. After all, remember that Jacob is the same person who stole the birthright from his brother. So if you take that kind of inclination and you magnify it with an intense hatred, it's a recipe for disaster. But I want you to look back 
at what Joseph does instead, or Jacob does instead. In verse 11, it says, the brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Jacob was fully aware of the animosity that his brothers had towards him. But he chooses to keep it to himself. Now the Hebrew word for this phrase here lends to this idea of guarding it, that Jacob was pondering, he was thinking through this, but he didn't tell anyone. He just kept it to himself. And so ultimately what happens is Jacob chooses to do nothing about the situation. And as father and head of the family, it was Jacob's responsibility. Jacob knew that he was supposed to step in and get in between the situation before anything could happen, but he decides not to. And ultimately because of his inaction, Jacob was unknowingly leading his son straight for his death. If this story stopped with Jacob's last interaction with Joseph, there would be no lessons from Joseph. It would be the end of Joseph. And that's gonna lead us to our first truth this morning, is that doing nothing will cost everything. Whether we realize it or not, we find ourselves in the same shoes as Jacob this morning, that we cannot be blind to the situation that is around us, that in the same way that Joseph is walking to his death, we need to realize that there are people all around us who are walking straight to their spiritual death. In a study done in 2023 by the research group Gallup, they found that in today's society, 33% of Americans don't follow Jesus. Now, Personally, I'm not a huge fan of percentages because sometimes you can kind of flip it. And if you're not careful, you can start to feel really good about this. You're like 67% of America follows Jesus. Go us, right? But the reality, it's a lot more serious. What that statistic tells us is that there are 111 million people who don't know Jesus. And that statistically, one out of every three people you come in contact with during your day probably doesn't know Jesus that should leave an impact on you because we know the end result of a life without Jesus. Paul says it this way in Romans 6, 23. He says, for the wages of sin is death. And that word death there comes from the Greek word thanatos. And thanatos, it carries both a physical and a spiritual weight behind it. And so what this means is that we understand without Jesus, we are left to the consequences of our sin. And scripture says the consequences of our sin are death and eternal separation from God. And so what that means is that if we do nothing, one third of Americans will spend eternity in hell. but we know the truth that a relationship with Jesus changes all of that, right? Because if the wages of sin is death, then the free gift in response to that from God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. If there is forgiveness of sins, there is a relationship with God. There is new life found in a relationship with Jesus. But people don't stumble into a relationship with Jesus. They're led to one. And here's the deal, whether we realize it or not, it's our responsibility to lead people to that relationship. Jesus laid out this responsibility when talking to his disciples in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. In verse 18, he says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So he's saying, look, this is a command. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. As Christians, our responsibility is to lead people to a relationship with Jesus by sharing his grace and his truth. That these verses, they are a command on our life that we are to take the message of Jesus, the message of the gospel into a broken world because um, Jesus is the only thing that saves. That the world desperately needs its savior. And Jesus says, I have given you this responsibility. It is up to you. But so often, we choose to ignore this responsibility. We do just what Jacob does in the story, right? Jacob knows, he knows what he's supposed to do. He just doesn't do it. And I don't want us to make the same mistake that Jacob makes because there is an eternal significance in the calling and the responsibility that God has placed on our lives. That you, I want you to understand the way you choose to interact with people can literally impact their eternities. 
And, and I'm not saying this to like scare you into some like guilt-ridden, half-hearted commitment to evangelize. I want you to understand that you're made for so much more than showing up to church on Sundays and singing some songs and going home. That you were created and called to make disciples. You were created to change the world through the message of the gospel that what we do has eternal significance. The cost is too high to do nothing. Paul talked about it this way in Romans 10, 14 through 15. He said, how then can they call on the one who they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Paul's point is that we can't, people can't know Jesus if we don't share Jesus. And so the responsibility that we have as Christians is to share the grace and truth of Jesus with the world. And here's the deal. If all we do is keep the message of Christ crucified to ourselves, we're no better than Jacob. Right? We're sitting and we're watching as people walk to their death. But if we'll lead the calling that God has called us to, if we'll answer this call and live out what he's asked us to do, that we would take the message of Jesus through the grace and truth of Jesus to the broken world, man, we will watch lives be changed. We will watch eternities be changed as we live out what God has created us for. The cost is too high to do nothing. So my first challenge to you this morning is don't let your life be marked with inaction, but step up choose to make a difference and to act in this way because you're called to more than sitting on the sidelines of your faith. Look with me at our next verses, verses 19 through 27. They said, here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of those cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. And when Reuben's heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. He said, let's not take his life. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern, and it was empty, and there was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on our way to take them down to Egypt. So Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So in these next verses, we're gonna get an introduction a little bit better to the brothers of Joseph. And in particular, we're gonna meet a guy named Reuben. Now, you can quickly figure out from these verses, Reuben's like the only good one in the bunch. Right, everybody else is trying to kill Joseph and Reuben's thinking, oh my gosh, I've got to get Joseph back to dad. And there's important things to understand about Reuben. Reuben is the oldest of the 12 sons. And so what that means is that Reuben, in a similar way to Jacob, he actually has a responsibility to lead and to protect his brothers, right? That is his call as the oldest sibling. But Reuben, similar to Jacob, doesn't really act in this moment either. Instead of standing up and stopping his brother's plans, right, he tries to outsmart them. So if he can just convince them to not kill Joseph, but just leave him in the pit, right, when they all leave, he'll come back and get Joseph, everything will be good. But his best laid plans, they're gonna fall flat. We don't really know why, but for some reason, Reuben leaves for an extended period of time. And during that time, the brothers decide to sell Joseph as a slave. And so Reuben comes back, no Joseph. So Reuben, in this moment, had good intentions to save his brother, but ultimately doesn't help. He came up with a clever plan of action, but the action never happened. And this leads us to our second truth for the morning, is that good intentions can't take the place of intentional action. And this is an incredibly important lesson from the story of Joseph because if we're honest with ourselves, this is probably where many of us find ourselves today. 
right? We have good intentions. We want to do good. We want to live a life that changes the, the world, right? We want to be involved in the kingdom of God and we want the ways that we interact and share the grace and truth of Jesus to just radically change people's lives and lead to eternities changed. We have good intentions, but not a lot of action. And I think if we're honest, a lot of this stems from this idea that the mission of making disciples is this grand mission. And I want you to hear me out when I say this. What I'm not saying is that the mission of making disciples isn't important because it is the most important thing that we can do as followers of Christ. What I mean by this grand mission is I think that we have created this idea in our head that creating disciples, that making disciples, right, requires these grand actions. And so we spend more time dreaming and thinking about what we could be doing rather than doing what we can. And I think you see the same mistake with Reuben, right? Reuben, the easiest thing for him to do is just to have a conversation with his brothers, which if we're honest, probably would have worked, right? He's the oldest brother. The brothers would have listened to him. And so he probably could have just been like, hey man, not a good idea. Let's not do this. I know we're angry. Take him back to dad. Everything will be okay. But instead of doing the simple thing, the easy thing, he, he crafts this concoction, this elaborate plan in his mind that he thinks will be good. In his good intentions, he comes up with this plan of action. But the action never gets to happen because the opportunity never happens. And so I think this highlights a lot of the same mistakes that we make when it comes to leading people to Jesus is we think more than we act. And so we feel like we need to have this plan of action ready in order to make disciples. And the reality is it's supposed to be much simpler than that. And so you need to hear me out. You don't need some five plan step, some five step plan and all of these things laid out for you in order to make disciples. The goal for us really is ultimately don't complicate the mission of making disciples because it's supposed to be so much simpler than we often make it in our heads. Jesus, when he called his original disciples to the Great Commission, he uses a word that we often translate as go. So for those of you that know the Great Commission, you know Matthew 28, 19 is typically translated at the beginning, therefore go and make disciples. But that Greek word is actually a participle. It's not a verb. And so in its original context, there is a much simpler instruction given by Jesus that the correct translation was as you were going, make disciples. Jesus' intentions for his disciples was that their everyday interactions would lead to them having opportunities to lead people to Jesus. That it was simple actions that led to crazy life change. And the same thing is still true for us today. That you don't have to stand from a rooftop with a megaphone to lead people to Jesus. You don't have to get up in a, in a board meeting with the shareholders and stand on the desk and give your life story to lead people to Jesus. The whole goal of the Great Commission is that you have opportunities in your life to lead people to Jesus through simple actions. This is why our mission statement here at Caris City is to share intentional grace with one another, with, with simple acts of kindness. And so showing intentional grace to others one person at a time, it's not about this idea of like blindly walking around and hoping that at some point we'll get the opportunity to bless people. The goal of intentional grace is that we are mindful and active in what we do. That we choose moments to lead and serve others like Jesus did. It's not about these crazy plans. It's about us doing something. And so I wanna give you some two really easy practical ways to work on this. The first one, I'm gonna challenge you to serve. Uh, you guys will probably get tired of hearing us say that, but there's a reason that we do this, that serving, it's being a part of the mission of God. And so here's my challenge to you. If you're in this room and, and you don't serve, and part of the reason is you're like, oh my gosh, I just don't know what I'm gonna do, like I need like this perfect thing laid out. What's the team that best fits me? What's the time that best fits me for this? How do I make the most impact in this? What do I do? Throw all that out the window. Serve. Find a place to get plugged in, whatever it is. 
no matter how simple or how big. We have ways to serve all the way from opening a door on Sunday mornings, all the way to leading on worship and everything in between. And if you're not sure where to get plugged in, easy. Come talk to me, come talk to Adam, come talk to Sean, come talk to Selena. We have ways to help you figure out what's a good fit for you. The second way I wanna challenge you to show intentional grace is with simple acts of kindness, intentional choices to love people like Jesus. You would be blown away at the impact you can have by simply personally inviting someone to church with an invite card. You would be blown away at the impact you would have by looking at somebody when you leave church today and going, hey, you wanna go get lunch? Calling somebody, hey, let's get coffee. Texting somebody, hey, I prayed for you today. Anything else I can do for you? And, and it can be bigger things too if you want. It can be things like mowing people's lawn. You can watch someone's kids so they can go have a date night. But the point of this is don't overcomplicate this. Don't make this, this ridiculously grand thing that none of us can accomplish. The goal is simple acts of service. That we love people the same way that Jesus did and the same way that we're called to. And here's what's crazy. If we can learn to do this, if we can act in the ways that, that aren't crazy and complicated, but that we're just mindful and active about what we do, these acts of grace, they lead people to the truth of Jesus. And what I will promise you is if you can learn to show the grace of Jesus this way, you will watch lives change. Something as simple as holding the door open on a Sunday morning, greeting someone with a smile, and telling them that you're glad they're here this morning can lead to a change eternity. And that's not just motivation. This isn't me being like, here's a little example of something that could happen. That's happened. We have stories of people in our church who came to know Jesus strictly because of the love they were shown when they walked in the door. The mission of making disciples isn't this complicated thing that we dream up. And so here's the deal. We don't become the kind of church that shakes the gates of hell because we want to be that kind of church. We become the kind of church that changes the world with action. And so we make the choice to be intentional behind what we do, what we say, how we live. And if we do that, you will be blown away by the impact we will have. Good intentions can't take the place of intentional action. Look at me our last verses this morning. We're gonna finish up with 29 through 36 here. So when Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't here, where can I turn now? And they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. And they took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we found this, examine it to see whether it's your son's robe. He recognized it and said, it is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been turned to pieces. And when Jacob tore his clothes, he put on a sack, uh, sackcloth and mourned for his son for many days. All of his sons and daughters came to comfort him but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. And so his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. The story at this point, if you're in Jacob and Reuben's shoes, doesn't look good. Whether it's because you think your, brother's, your son's dead or your brother's lost forever somewhere in Egypt, both of them believe they're never gonna see Joseph again. So it looks pretty dark, but here's what I love. Verse 36 changes everything. Verse 36 tells us that Joseph, in the middle of all of this happening, gets sold by the Midianites to Potiphar, who's a chief official in Pharaoh's guard. And what we know, if you're familiar with the story of Joseph, is this is gonna be one of the first instances that God is gonna use to begin to bless Joseph. And by the end of this story, you're gonna see that God not only blesses Joseph, but he sustains and grows the nation of Israel here in Egypt. What I love about the story of the coat of the many colors is yes, it has challenges at the beginning. Right? There's a lot of hard truth we walk through but it also gives us the ultimate hope. Failure is not the end of the story. That if we choose to act in the ways that Joseph and Reuben did, right, we, we can look at their story and look at Jacob and Reuben because they think everything's hopeless up to this point. But what they forget is that God's in control. So for us, here's a big takeaway from this. 
Sometimes things don't work out the way we plan them to. And, and so this may happen in one of two ways, right? We can look at this in the perspective of saying, look, sometimes we miss the mark. If, if we're called to make disciples, there are gonna be moments where we fail, moments where we don't do it, moments where we mess up. There's also gonna be moments where we do everything right. We're like, man, I'm a rock star. I can't believe I just shared my faith with this person this way. They're gonna come to know Jesus and they're gonna walk away. But in those moments, we have to remember it's not the end of the story, that God is still moving, that God is still working. And so what we have to do is be faithful to continue on this mission of making disciples regardless of the outcome. Because sometimes we're not gonna see the fruits of that in the moment, right? Not, not everybody's gonna come to know Jesus as a result of what we do. And so I need you to hear me when I say this, that yes, God is moving, God is always working in his people, but it doesn't mean that every person that we talk to is gonna end up giving their life to Christ. I mean, Jesus had people that he interacted with that walked away from him. But here's the promise I will make you. If we are intentional about living out this mission, if we will answer the call to make disciples, God will move. You will watch lives be changed, you will watch eternities change, and we will knock down the gates of hell as a church because when God's people are moving in his plans and his purposes, God moves through that. Because he has the ultimate authority and the final say. And I know this, not just because I'm sitting up here telling it to you, I know this because I'm a living testimony of that. I gave my life to Christ when I was 16 years old. And what you need to know about me is I was not some overnight conversion. Okay, I had friends in my life who loved me deeply and cared about my soul. And I had two in particular, they were my two best friends from high school, Josh and Chandler. They were relentless in the ways that they shared the grace and truth of Jesus with me. They took every opportunity they could to talk to me about Jesus. Chandler and I played football together. And so he would talk to me every moment he could in between practices or on the way to, bu on, on the way to games when we're on the bus, every opportunity. Conversation about God, conversation about God, conversation about God. And Josh, I have never seen someone so consistent in inviting someone to church in my life. Okay, I got a text every single Wednesday, come to youth, come to youth, come to youth, come to youth, come to youth. And it got to a point where he didn't just text me, hey, come with me. He would text me and say, hey, my dad and I are outside, get in the truck. For all their effort, nothing changed for a year. I made no decision to follow Jesus. They didn't give up. They kept talking to me, kept talking to me, kept talking to me. One day we had a, an event coming up in, in the youth ministries around us. It was a conference called D-NOW. It was for the students. And Gaddy texted me and was like, hey, you should go to this. And I was like, well, all right. It was at that event that I ended up giving my life to Christ. And I have fond memories of that. There's so much of that that I don't remember. Like a lot of it just feels like a blur at this point. But, but here's something I vividly remember about that night in particular. I remember getting up from where I was sitting and I go down to the altar and I'm, I, I lay down and I go to pray. I'm sitting in front of the subwoofer. It's blasting air into my face. And I just start praying. And I, I can remember, I hear Chandler and, and Josh run up beside me. They lay down, they throw their arms over me. They start praying over me. They start crying. I start crying. We're all just like a big teary, slobbery mess at this point. But what I remember most about that story is my two friends who intentionally showed me the grace of Jesus over and over and over, who didn't give up on me. And I can honestly say to you that it's because of what they did in my life that I'm standing here before you today. the way you choose to interact with people, it will change their eternities. And so my challenge to you this morning, and don't sit on the sidelines. Don't, don't just leave here today and let this be another week where we leave and we come back on Sundays and we repeat the motions, but let's be a church, man, that, that takes the mission to the front lines, that we would be invested in the lives of the people around us, that we would show the grace and the truth of Jesus in simple but breathtaking ways. Because if we will do that, I'm telling you, we will be a church that changes the world but it takes action.
the cost is too high to do nothing. So what will you do? Let's pray.